Back when I was younger, I did some survey work for a logging company in Alaska, as I was fit and liked to hike. They sent me in first to check out the terrain and figure out the best ways into the area they wanted to harvest. I always traveled light, just a backpack with a United States Army mess kit, some MRS, a few spare clothes, a fire kit, a bivouac, sack, and axe, a knife some bear spray and my late granddad's revolver. I also used to cut me a nice thick hiking stick. With all that gear packed, I set out on foot. The first night was largely very quiet, and I got a good night's sleep. Only one time I woke up to what I thought was the wind rustling through the trees, and I didn't think much of it. The next day, I arrived at the designated logging area and started to do my work. Around noon, I started to get that eerie feeling of being watched. I had had this feeling before, but I always blamed my imagination for it. Well, it grew more and more over the day. Right when I was about to set up camp for the night, I heard some rustling in the brush again and caught a glimpse of something big huddling out of sight. Needless to say, I skipped setting up the camp and booked it out of there. I walked about ten miles until I was too tired to move on. The feeling of being watched had stopped, and I deemed it safe to set up my camp. I woke up in the morning, and the first thing I saw were bear tracks of what I think was a huge grizzly going all over my campsite. I have never broke up the camp this fast again. I made sure my revolver was loaded and within arm's reach at all times and kept my bear spray at the ready on the way back, but nothing happened anymore. I told the logging company about my encounter and they said they will take the necessary precautions. A few months later, when the logging operation was in full swing, a worker was attacked by what was later described as a huge male grizzly bear. A year or so later, hunters in that area shot one of the biggest grizzlies I have ever seen and judging by the size of its paws, it could have been that very bear stalking me on that hike. was driving through Alaska trying to get to Haines to take the ferry to Washington. Stopped at this small town bar to ask for directions to a place to spend the night. Everyone in the bar turned and looked at me like I was an alien from outer space. The older lady offered to give me lodging for free for a price. Wink wink. I was a fit soldier that just left the military so I guess I was extremely attractive at the time. I knew from the safety briefings that STDs were prevalent in the area, so I said, uh, that's fine, I'll find some place down the road. You're good, thanks. Anyway, I found this abandoned quarry and set up my tent next to this vehicle that had bullet holes all over it, shotgun to hell. When I settled down into the sleeping bag, I heard these footsteps from above the half crater I was in. I took out my knife and placed it over my neck under the sleeping bag and tried to go to sleep, but my hypervigilance was activated too far, and there was no way to see outside the tent. I had too much stuff in the car people would want, so I packed up the tent and drove down the road. I slept on the turnoff in the car overnight and woke up to a nice sunrise over the mountain range. Myself and a few others were camped at a spot called Ray Lakes in California. We, being reasonable persons, do not hike at night, but we were sat by our campfire watching a night hiker's headlamp come steadily down and down and down along switchbacks which awaited us the next day. Our concerns were, why the F would a person with a tent on their back willingly hike at night, and that we had caught six fish when the limit was five. Once the stranger reached our camp, it turned out he ran with a crew that saw the Sierra Club, his right wing. He was interested in killing all the trout in the high Sierra Lake so that a natural stasis of loud-ass frogs and mosquitoes, of which there are entirely too many in my opinion, could regain dominance over the land. This March I went hiking or camping with some friends and there was one guy who's never been before. 
We decided to set up camp once the sun had gone down and we got tired. New guy comments on how it's weird that there's so much dew on the ground when it hasn't rained. When our headlamps hit the ground, sure enough, there's millions of tiny glowing dots of reflection covering almost every inch of the ground, like morning dew. I point out the daw is glowing red and tell him to look closer. He learned three things that night. He learned why we use camp hammocks instead of traditional tents. He learned that wolf spider eyes glow red when hit with bright light, and most importantly, he learned that he doesn't like being in the woods at night. When I was 15 or 16, I lived in a very rural area. I'm talking wooded areas right in my backyard, complete with all the flora and fauna that goes with them. I loved to go out back and walk the paths in the forest right after the sun went down, but right before it got too dark. I would always take large sticks with me, hinking sticks, as the wildlife there could be dangerous. I would also take my dog sometimes. I lived in a place with a few neighbors who had a lot of land, mostly so their wildlife could graze, so besides the few times my neighbors went out to get cattle or other stuff, we were pretty much left alone. That day I had my dog and one of my favorite sticks with me. Yes, I had favorite hiking sticks. Don't judge. It was getting late, but I didn't want to go inside despite the rapidly darkening sky. I decided I would take the long way out of the forest, so I steered my dog onto a trail that I only took when I wanted to go right by the river. It went by the bank and then straight into a thick set of brush, a thicket where deer loved to ritz and graze. I wasn't afraid of deer. They usually left us alone and seemed to dislike my dog, so I didn't think anything was off when I felt like I was being watched, just animals being animals. But as I advanced into the thicket, my dog began to growl low in her throat, and I began to freak out. I have panic attacks a lot, especially in very tense situations. Now, with growing fear and the feeling that some hand was off, I urged my dog to run. She did. I went straight after her, running faster than I ever have before. I don't exactly remember what happened, but I remember that I tripped and fell close to the edge of the thicket. I looked up and saw something I will never forget. In the shadows of the thicket, something was staring at me with bright yellow eyes. It looked like the shadow of a man, but I don't know what it was. It seemed a bit off. I can't recall its exact features, but when I saw it, a feeling of terror so horrible and intense engulfed me. A feeling that gave me two options. Run or cower. There was not fight. I knew I could not win. I was going to cower. I was not going to move. But my dog had other plans. She dragged me, dragged me right out of that thicket. And onto my feet I've never ran so fast in my life. It was a primal instinct, one I could not obey. I didn't go into the forest for a month after that. Even then, I was never fully comfortable. I never told anyone about my encounter. Only a few close friends who scoff at me. But I swear, that night I saw something. I don't know what, but I do know that I saw it. And although I have had few nightmares featuring it, I believe it is the most terrifying experience I have ever had. Something's out here with us. Last weekend, one of my friends brought up the idea of camping. At first, I was opposed to it as it's fall and cold outside, and the idea of having to sleep in a tent with another person just didn't seem appealing. But when all five of us talked about it, I realized that maybe it wasn't such a bad idea after all. We decided to do it next weekend. Okay, now. This morning, we went out and bought everything we needed. Tents, snakes, a lighter, and a couple of more things that don't need mentioning. We decided it would be best to do it in the woods two hours away from any road or houses. I was particularly upset about that as anything could happen from some random person attacking us to a bear sneaking in our tents. 
But we'd have our car parked on the nearest road, so if anything did happen, we could just run to it. At least that's what some others said. I brought up the fact it's a two-hour walk, but of course I was ignored. We drove as far as we could before we got out to start walking. I noticed a few things. First of all, no sound of wildlife. No crickets, no birds. No, nothing making sound. And it felt odd, like something was slightly off. I chalked it up to my nerves acting up and ignored it. Where should we set the rents up at? Rob asked, taking a puff of his joint. Right over there. Looks good, Nate replied, motioning for Rob to pass it to him. Who's setting it up? After a little conversation, we decided Dan and Murphy could do it while the rest of us goes out to see if we can find any squirrels to hunt. I doubted it. It didn't exactly seem like this place was crawling with wildlife. Grab my riffle, would ya? I grabbed it and threw it at him. Don't worry, it wasn't loaded yet. He catches it, saying a quick thanks, and off we went. We were out for hours looking to no avail. There was absolutely nothing. I didn't even see any bugs. Maybe we should go on back now. We can eat the stuff we brought. I suggested. Rob and Nate stopped walking, to which I assumed meant they agreed. We turned back around and started walking back towards camp. A couple of minutes of walking, I heard a sound. It was quiet, but we all heard it. We stopped walking to look around. Behind us, there was a deer. Except, it wasn't normal. Its horns were growing out of its mouth, and it had five legs. I had never seen anything like it before, but I've heard of it. Deformed deers, I wasn't too worried. We decided not to kill it because we definitely weren't about to eat it, being too worried about catching some type of disease. I wondered, though, how long has that deer been following us, being so silent that we hadn't even noticed it. We made it back to camp about an hour later. We ended up eating some cans of chili we brought with us. We cooked it over the fire we made. The five of us were sharing tents, two in one and three in another. I was sharing with Nate. Robert, Murphy, and Dan were in the other. We stayed up for a few more hours singing songs and drinking beer before we headed off to bed. I fell asleep about an hour after laying down. Click, 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 click. I woke up to a clicking noise. It took me a second to register what was happening. I assumed it was one of the guys doing something, but just in case I grabbed my gun and unzipped the tent. I froze. The deer from before was standing outside my tent, its mouth moving weirdly. Its teeth were clicking against each other every few seconds from the weird movement. It followed us all the way back. How did we not notice? I zipped the tent back and tried to ignore it. Needless to say, I got no sleep that night. The next morning, all six of us decided to stay one more thing before packing up to leave. It was weird. I felt like something was messing with my mind, that my brain wasn't working correctly. I was scared I just didn't know what of. Me, Dan, Nate, Robert, Murphy, and wait, and what was I talking about? There was only five, no, six of us. Wait, six? Never mind, it's not important. I spent all evening wondering what was wrong with my mind. I could tell the others felt the same way. That night all six of us went to sleep, three in one and three in another. I was with Nate and someone, something felt wrong, but I just couldn't put my foot on it. That night I woke up to the same clicking noise as last night, this time from inside the tent. I was too scared to move had the deer somehow made it into the tent. However, I felt Nate shift to get up. What? I heard him say before he went silent, cutting off whatever he was about to say. What the hell? I heard him say again, slightly louder this time. I felt something move on my left side, which was strange because Nate was on my right side. Oh, oh shit, I heard before I felt someone leap over me onto Nate. I woke up the next morning panting. Was it all a dream? I wondered. All five of us packed up to leave. Something still felt wrong. No. One of us felt wrong. Nate was off. He talked the same and acted the same, but it was the way he looked. Have you ever heard of Uncanny Valley? Like that, I know something was off, but I just couldn't put my finger on it. I ignored it, and with that all five of us walked to the car.
got in and took off. I couldn't help but feel like I made a mistake, like I was about to unleash something unholy into the town we live in, like I did something bad. In August 1993, I was a deputy sheriff in Pierce County, Washington. I was a part of a search for a missing hiker. We had split up into single searchers early into the investigation. I was assigned to an area near Evans Creek Preserve. This area was state land, but adjacent to federal land. It was approximately 2.15 p.m. and the weather was overcast. The woods can become very dark in this area, though I was familiar with the general location. As I conducted my search for the missing hiker, I encountered an unknown entity that was staring at me. It was several hundred feet away, but I could make out that it was human, shaped, but very large and tall. I cautiously approached the individual. As I got closer, it was obvious that this man was nude and that he was of tremendous size. I was within 50 yards or so when he bolted to my right into the deep dark woods at a speed that was completely impossible for a human being to achieve. I yelled for him, or it, to stop, but he continued to run away. My instincts told me that this giant may somehow be involved in the disappearance of the hiker. By this time I had drawn my weapon. I was hesitant to call for help or to report what I had witnessed. I was even questioning myself as to what this could have been. Was I hallucinating this giant being? I tried to follow the giant man, but it was simply impossible to do so. After 15 minutes or so, I was getting spooked and decided to find my way back to the trail and continue with a search for the hiker. I'll admit, I was fearful of being ambushed by the giant man. The giant man was at least 12 feet in height very muscular in build, olive skin with no visible hair. He was completely nude. I didn't get close enough to describe facial features, but the head was enormous and oval shaped. He never made any sounds. It just seems impossible that anything of that size really exists. The hiker was eventually found nearer to Mitt, Rainier, which was east of my location. I remained with the department for another three years until I moved to Oregon and started working for a security firm. After my encounter with a giant, I was much more wary of the outdoors. I still questioned what I witnessed that day, but I never told anyone other than my wife and a close friend about the incident. I'm not sure if they believe me. I have never heard of any related sightings here in the Pacific Northwest. This is why I contacted you. Have you ever heard or read of a similar sighting or encounter? Do the giants really exist? Thanks for your time. I grew up in western New York near Rochester, not too far from the Canadian border. My dad built a mini mansion that backed up to the forever wild woods. That's the New York State program that keeps the wilderness as is. Once the house was built, the woods became the playhouse for myself and my closest friend, DJ. It is the early 1990s and we love being outside. One day while exploring, we found an amazing section about 50 minutes walk into the woods that was a gorgeous swamp full of flowers and light. I remember approaching it. There were snapped trees all around and straight branches jammed into the ground like spikes. The solid land went into the swamp like a peninsula. The trees were almost like walls on each side that funneled us out onto it. We approached the water and saw snapping turtles quickly submerged. Being kids, we started skipping rocks and throwing boulders to get splashes, just doing what kids do. Then out of nowhere, DJ and I felt a wave of fear, sort of a sixth sense. Our hair stood up. We were both looking around for what triggered this primal feeling. DJ pointed to a tree across the water, and I can only describe it as if the top half was bending back and forth, not like the wind was gently pushing it, but like it was close to snapping, left then right, back and forth. It was bending, creaking loud over and over, quicker and quicker. The bottom of the tree barely moved. 
Then out of nowhere, there was this rumbling growl that was so loud it shook our insides. I've been around loud things before and even learned to shoot an 8-gauge black powder shotgun. No sound compared to the force of this. Picture your soul getting pushed out your back and then springing back inside like a giant invisible rubber band. In the pierced silence of this, we both ran for our effing lives. The whole way home, we ran through bushes and branches, ripping up our exposed skin. We both thought we could hear pursuit all around us, but said nothing. Once home, we tried sharing what happened with my parents, but they wouldn't listen. We decided to stay inside for the rest of the day. As usual, DJ was spending the night, and we decided to crash in the support, a 25 by 25 foot room filled with double hung windows on two exterior walls, a sliding glass door that led to a three-story deck, and a, a French door that led to a formal living room. Dad had worked hard. He went from a garbage man to a business owner, so this house was massive. Anyway, DJ was on the couch while I lay on the floor in front of the TV with a Nintendo. It was summer, so all the double-hung windows were opened wide. I stretched out with my arms behind my head, my neck on a couple of pillows, and my fingers were interlaced. My hands were sort of folding up the back of my head with elbows flared out. DJ was out and snoring, and I was half asleep watching something on the TV. As God is my is my witness. Out of nowhere, I felt a massive hand engulf both my hands and part of my wrist and pull me toward the windows. I moved a good two, three feet, and effing lost it, screaming in terror. It released me, and within a minute, my dad ran in. DJ was silent and just staring at me. I told my dad what happened, so he went to each window and said the screens were all slid down and in place. He said that it was just a dream for me to man up and shut up. I shut up and prayed he'd just go back out. I looked at DJ and asked him if he had seen it. He just looked at me and didn't say anything about it. He ended up calling his parents and getting picked up in the middle of the night. I went upstairs and tried to sleep in my room. The next day I called DJ's house to see if he wanted to come over and his mom said he didn't feel good and to not call again until I heard from him. This confused my 12-year-old mind. We never got together again after that. I'd see him occasionally. He was cold with me every time. Eventually, at the end of summer, I ran into him on the canal path, one of our fishing spots, and decided to question him. His mom wasn't there to be the buffer. He finally confessed that on that night, for some reason, he awoke and saw a predator grab and pull me. He didn't use that specific word. Instead, he described a massive, clear, but distorted shimmer thing that reached in and grabbed me. I never knew others had seen this cloak of invisibility. I now refer to it as a predator. Did it lift the screen up slide easily enough and then close it that quick? Did it somehow pass through the fiberglass mesh? I just don't know. I looked in the morning but saw no tracks, and DJ thought it was a ghost. I didn't put it all together until much later as an adult. I think it followed me home after we trespassed on its turf. It could have hurt us easily at any time, but it didn't. I almost think it had a sick type of humor and enjoyed terrifying us a little bit. I never went that far back in the woods after that. In September 2020, I had a chilling encounter that still haunts my memory to this day. I was on my way to work, driving along United State 10 near Reed City, Michigan. It was a typical morning, and I was lost in thought, sipping my coffee and listening to the radio. Little did I know that this ordinary commute would lead to a brush with the extraordinary. As I cruised down the highway, something caught my eye in the rearview mirror. At first, I thought it was a trick of the light. But when I glanced back again, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. A massive seven-foot-tall creature, weighing at least 375 pounds, sprinted across the road behind me. It moved with an uncanny speed and agility for its size. My heart pounded in my chest as I strained to catch another glimpse of the creature. It was covered in dark, matted fur, 
and its form was unlike anything I had ever seen. This was no bear or any known animal that should be roaming the woods of Michigan. I watched in disbelief as it vanished into the dense forest on the other side of the road. I was left in a state of shock, my mind racing to comprehend what I had just witnessed. I had always been a skeptical person when it came to tales of cryptids and creatures of the unknown, but this encounter had shaken me to my core. I never saw it, but in 1975 I was newly married about 21 years old and had a small baby. My sister, who was a teenager, was visiting us. My husband, my sister, and I had all gone to our bedrooms to settle down and go to sleep. I would say it was around 11 or 12 at night. We were just starting to relax and get sleepy, when out of nowhere there was this horrible loud howl or yell. I mean, it was so loud it made my chest vibrate and my ears hurt. The sound was not human, but had a guttural human-like sound mixed with what sounded like a wolf. We were living in a mobile home at the time, and it howled just outside our back door, in the hallway near our bedroom. We jumped out of bed, looked at each other, and both said at the same time, What the hell was that? My husband was ten years older than I was and was an avid hunter. He wasn't the kind of guy to scare easily. His face drained of color. My sister came running down the hallway, white as a ghost, and said, what was that? I told her I didn't know. My husband said he was getting his rifle and grabbed it out of the closet. He opened up the back door and yelled out into the wind. You better get the S out of here or I will blow your head off. He listened a moment before I yelled at him to please shut the door. He did and we never heard any more after that. Needless to say, we stayed up all night afraid to go to sleep. I have never forgotten that how. There is no way it was a dog or coyotes. I have heard both how. It wasn't a guy joking around either. It was so loud, there is no way a human could have made that sound. I love your show and am glad to hear. I am not the only one who has heard something like this. I am in summer camp and something is throwing people off trees. A little introduction before we begin. My friends and I have been going to summer camp every year. Tom, Jack, Susan, and Emily are my friends who have been accompanying me since forever. We're high school students. This time we chose a different camp. It was called Camp Jacob, and it's on a small island called Jacob's Isle. We travel to Jacob's Isle on a ferry. It is about three and a half hour journey from the mainland, and the first thing we noticed was that there is no cell reception here. David is the leader of the summer camp, and he has a satellite phone for communication with the ferry and mainland. We hiked till the camp. It was a half hour hike. We saw the establishment was amazing. There were two dozen small huts made of wood. The main building was no different. The main building was in the middle of the camp, and it comprised of a common room, kitchen, dining room, a storage room, and an infirmary. Twelve huts, each on either side of the main building. Each hut had two bunk beds and can fit four people. Tom, Jack, and I got in hut seven, along with fellow camper Ashwin. Emily and Susan went to hut twenty. One, all four corner huts. One, twelve, thirteen, twenty-four were occupied by them. We were to unpack and meet the others in thirty minutes, where we shall make a bonfire for the evening. It was a fun experience. We have made friends with Ashwin, and we also met the girls sharing the hut with Susan and Emily. They were Lily and Rose. Lily and Rose were cousins. We had dinner and were told that we would go to the sunrise point in the morning, and so we have to wake up by 4.30 a.m., as the sunrise is at 5.45 a.m. It is a half-hour hike, and it wasn't easy to get up so early. We started the hike at 5 a.m. and were told it was about 10 minutes away, but in reality it took twice the time. We were on the east coast of the island. It was a beach of white sand. This was my new favorite place. Jack had his camera out to capture the moment when the sun rises. It was a beautiful sight and worth waking up early. 
We hiked back to the camp through the forest when we heard a growling sound. It was scary. The counselors huddled us and escorted us back to the camp. I could see that they were nervous. We were told to go to the main building for breakfast. I saw David and three others went scouting north of the camp. The other counselors were smiling, but they were tense. What do you think that scent was? I asked. It was scary. I don't care what it was, and I don't want to know, Susan replied. Only that it should stay away from us, Emily said. Come on, Peter. Don't scare the girls, Tom laughed. Yeah, it can be a bird or something. The forest can make it sound scarier, Ashwin said with conviction. I disagree. Something scary is out there. Check this out. Jack gestured us to take a look at his camera. The small lead screen wasn't so easy to look at, but Emily saw what Jack wanted to show. It took a lot of pointing and zooming before I could see the red dots behind the trees. Jack thought they were eyes. I thought they were lens flares or something. This is not a scary movie, all right. It must be some lens flare thingy, I said, but deep down I was scared too. Susan queried, Guys, where is Lily and Rose? Must be somewhere here, Ashwin said. I haven't seen them after we came back to camp, Dom responded in a worried manner. Come, Susan, let's check the hut out. Emily grabbed on Susan's hand, and they went to find Lily and Rose. No sooner did they leave the common room did we hear the same growling sound, followed by loud shrieks. We ran outside to see Emily fainted and Susan holding her. Then I saw the lifeless body of Rose. Blood splattered everywhere, as if she has jumped from a tall building. Another bone-chilling growl, and then I froze. I saw Lily flying. Something had thrown her from a tree, and she came crashing down just beside Rose. I couldn't scream. This was something which I had never expected to witness. This couldn't be a dream, as I don't have the imagination to imagine something as gruesome as this. The counselors came running out and asked us to check if anyone else is missing. It was a huge mess. Everyone was shouting. It took some time for us to settle down. We were scared to death. The bodies were moved to the infirmary in the main building. Everyone else was accounted for. David and the three others who left with him returned, and they called the mainland for the ferry. The camp was obviously canceled. The growling continued. We were told to pack up our stuff, and we would leave after three hours. It wasn't easy to wait for three long hours. We have to hike south to go to the dock. They should send the army to kill this thing, Emily said, still shaking. The growling continued. Maybe this thing has given birth or something and feel threatened when we came here, Susan said. Stop trying to justify murder, I shouted. I know she was just trying to help, trying to make sense of it all, but I was scared shitless. I am sorry. I am just scared. I apologize. Susan put her hand on mine. It's okay. I understand. We were all called outside and David announced, given the circumstances. We will not hike to the dock. We will wait here for help to arrive. The sheriff's department along with the forest rangers will be arriving soon and they will escort us out of here. Till then stay quiet. Please, don't wander off anywhere. If you have to go back to the hut, then inform a counselor. Don't go out alone. This was good news. After a few tense hours, we were escorted out to the ferry and returned home. On the way back, we were told it was a bear, which must have done it. But it was a bizarre scenario. No one has ever heard anything like this before. I don't buy it one bit. Something is definitely wrong in that island. I have promised myself no more summer camps. But I still have nightmares, and I feel that I am back at the camp. It is nighttime, and something is throwing me down from the top of a tree. I'll never forget that fateful day in Illinois six years ago, the day I stood at the grave of my beloved wife, Lulu. Her passing had been sudden, a cruel twist of fate that had ripped her from my life. It was a pain I thought I would never recover from, and I was there at the funeral watching in disbelief as the casket was lowered into the cold earth.
The sound of dirt hitting the coffin lid haunted me for years. Life had other plans for me, and I soon found myself in Kansas, trying to leave behind the memories of Lulu. I had been living there for three years, merely going through the motions of existence. There was nothing extraordinary about this part of my story. Such things happen every day. But then came the strange part, the inexplicable events that have left me puzzled and restless. It all started when I received a letter from my old home in Illinois, postmarked and signed with Lulu's name, unmistakably in her handwriting. I was certain of it because I compared it with letters she had written me before our marriage, letters I had kept as precious mementos. In that letter, Lulu claimed to be lonely and missing me terribly, urging me to return to her. But it contained a sentence that sent shivers down my spine. You all thought I died, but I did not, and am much better than when I saw you last. I couldn't fathom what that meant. How could someone who had been buried come back to life? Initially, I believed it to be a sick joke, perhaps the work of some friends back in Illinois. However, as more letters arrived, my unease grew. These letters, filled with affection and longing, provided no answers, only more questions. One particularly unnerving letter reached me from Concordia, Kansas, near where I used to live before coming to Nebraska. The writer lamented the fact that I had left before she could reach me, and the handwriting remained identical to Lulu's. This couldn't be a prank. It was something more sinister and inexplicable. My anxiety grew, and I sent some of the letters back to Lula's parents, who confirmed the handwriting as their daughters but were as mystified as I was. Frustration gnawed at me, pushing me to address one of the letters to Mrs. W.W.S. Amoson. That letter, too, came back, returned from the dead. Letter office. The last letter, received about three weeks ago, was dated from Table Rock, Nebraska, and stated that Lulu was there. Sick and in dire need of help, I rushed to Table Rock, determined to get to the bottom of this bizarre mystery. Upon my arrival, I learned that a woman matching Lulu's description had been staying at a local hotel. She was sick, rarely leaving her room, and departed suddenly without revealing her destination. The hotel register had an entry under the name Mrs. Lulu Amoson, with no address provided. It was the same handwriting and the woman's description closely matched that of my dear Lulu from the last time I had seen her. Frustration and confusion gave way to a resolute determination. I decided to return to Illinois and had Lulu's remains exhumed, only to find her, as she had been buried years ago. There was no mistaking that fact. Now I stand at the crossroads of this inexplicable enigma, and my curiosity and apprehension gnaw at me who had been sending those letters, and who was the woman who had been using Lulu's name. I am not a superstitious man, but this bewildering mystery has shaken me to my core. My reputation remains untarnished, and my employer vouches for my character. Should I receive any more letters, I am resolved not to let them torment me, but to uncover the truth behind this eerie riddle. And when I do, I have promised to share my findings with the world. I'm writing today because I just read the story from a lady who is claiming the Mothman lived in her backyard. I don't completely disbelieve her claims as I'm in no position to do so. That's up to you and your investigators. I do know we have lots of underground creatures and many unexplained things in the woods. I wanted to tell you about an experience I had when I still lived back home in Wayne, West Virginia. It was around 2003. It was fall, I think. Being that I grew up in the W.O.B. Mountains, I've always been aware of the stories of the Mothman, creatures similar to the Mothman and what my great-grandmother called panthers. I don't know what these panthers really were, but she had a ton of stories about her father having to outsmart them and keep them away while traveling through the woods to get to town. I know she wasn't describing a mountain lion or bobcat. We all know what those are. And as far as I know, those hills aren't roaming grounds for mountain lions. 
They always said these creatures were vicious. They'd snatch who and whatever they could. However, they were afraid of fire. So it's fall. My ex-husband and I had been at my aunt's house for a birthday party. She lives on a country road with the mountains behind the house. For miles, there's nothing but woods back there. We were the first to leave. It was around dusk, and I was following my ex-husband out to the car while carrying my two-year-old son. Right before we reached the car, we were stopped dead in our tracks by the creepiest sound I have ever heard. It was so loud, echoing off the hills. It sounded very similar to a woman screaming bloody murder, just like the stories my great-grandmother told, but was definitely not a woman. It was one of those sounds that just feels ominous and sends those cold chills down your spine. I looked at my ex-husband and could tell it frightened him. That's what scared me more than anything. He was an avid woodsman and hunter. He knew the woods, could happily live in a tent in the woods, and wasn't afraid of much in life in general. I started searching the tree line with my eyes, just trying to see if I could see it. I could feel it staring right down at us. Yet we were both kind of frozen in shock. Then he gave me a look and told me to get my son and my, myself in the car immediately. I did, but thought we probably should have told everyone in the house to be careful when they went to leave. That was the only time in the 25 years I lived in. Yeah, that I heard that sound. Though, I continued to hear stories over the years. I don't know what that thing really is, and I don't want to find out personally. I also had a neighbor in 2006 that told me some pretty scary stuff. She said she was living in a house on Buffalo Creek Road in Wayne County, WVW. This is a back road, woods and mountains on both sides. My family owned quite a bit of land out there. There were mounds up on the mountains where the Native Americans buried their dead. She said there was an old cabin a little ways behind and to the right of the house. She was there alone. It was dark and getting late, so she decided to go to bed. She said as soon as she turned the lights off, she started hearing lots of racket coming from the cabin. Like pots and pans clanging together, glass breaking, etc., she thought it was a group of rowdy teens messing around in there, so she went out on the porch and yelled to tell them to hit the road. The noise stopped, but she didn't see any kids. She went back in to grab a flashlight and went closer to the cabin to investigate. She could see something dark move past the windows. She shined the light in, and it apparently looked right out the window at her. She booked it back to the house and locked herself in. She described it as Mothman-like but she didn't think for sure. That's what it was. She said it was pure evil. You could feel it. She said it was taller than her, all dark in color. Red eyes walked upright. I believed her. She wasn't one to make things up, and she was clearly frightened to tell the story. To make matters worse, that wasn't the last encounter that she had with the creature. There was another night when she was babysitting her nieces and nephews. She said it came up on the porch and started pacing back and forth. You could hear the boards creak with every step. They locked everything up and all ran into her bedroom and locked themselves in. They all were huddled together on the bed when it came around to the window. I guess it rapped on the window and scratched at it. They literally all hid under the covers. I guess they were all screaming and freaking out. She said it eventually went back to the front porch and was there until close to dawn. It wasn't long after that they moved. Now, I will say that I loved being in those woods on Buffalo Creek during the day. We always had fun. We'd find arrowheads and all kinds of different treasures the Indians left behind. At night, however, we wanted to be inside. I hated the back room, closest to the woods. My great-grandfather built several houses on that road. My family still lives there. It just always felt like there was something out there at night. The natural noises would get quiet all of a sudden. It just always seemed scary at night. Even as an adult, I would run from the car to the house. I don't know what's out there, but I'd say there are too many stories and witnesses to discount it.
The strange incident took place near Powhatan, West Virginia, in December 1934. I was eight years old. At the time, my father worked for Elkhorn, Piney Cole, and McDunn. He and the other miners would take a train to the mine each day. The day before Christmas Eve, my father mentioned an unusual sighting he and the others on the train had while traveling back to Powhatan from the mine that evening. As they looked out towards the east, they noticed a very large bird flying above the trees. My father was a very simple man and didn't believe in any nonsense, but this large bird really caught his attention. He described it as a freakish-sized owl, very dark in color. The sky was getting dark, but they could still make out the large form. He said it also looked at the train as it flew over the trees. Nobody on the train could figure out what it was. The mere fact that my father even mentioned it suggested that it must have been an unusual sight. My father was scheduled off from work for three days during the Christmas holiday. On December 27th, he was getting ready for work, but said he felt poorly. My mother was concerned because he had a high fever and awful chills. She insisted he stay home and telephone the doctor. My father was reluctant to stay home and put up a good argument, but my mother was not going to back down. She put him to bed and waited for the doctor. Well, we waited for hours until the telephone rang. The operator told my mother that the doctor was at McDunn. There had been a horrible train explosion. She couldn't talk, but said that the doctor's wife asked her to contact us. My mother was pale when she told my father what had happened. I remember they both started praying and crying. For years, both of them thought the large bird was an angel sent by God as a warning, and that my father's life was saved for a reason. My father never went back to the mine. It turned out that he had contracted polio, though he was very lucky since he survived it with only a slight limp. We soon moved away to a small town in Kentucky where my father found the calling and became a Pentecostal preacher. He told his story of survival to anyone who would listen until the day he died. I happened to read your stories while looking on the internet with my great-grandson. I always assumed my father saw something more divine. That's what he always believed. I'm not so sure now. Back in July of this year, I ordered eight towels from Amazon, and I remember receiving the box, and I have a vivid memory of rolling each towel up and putting them away. And I also remember this was a few days before we went on vacation, because I remember being excited that our house or dog sitter would have fresh towels. I return a week later from vacation and can't find the towels anywhere. I thought maybe our sitter took them for some odd reason, but never asked thinking it would come off rude and or weird. I looked everywhere and no towels. How do you misplace eight towels? So as time went on, I forgot about it. But then four months later, I get a notification from Amazon saying I'm getting a refund and it's for the towels. I clicked on it, thinking this is crazy and low, and behold, I got a refund for eight towels because the box was returned to them, and for some reason, the box was unable to be delivered. I don't know what happened, glitch in the matrix, but I am 100% sure. I got those two elves, and then they disappeared. T.S. I always check my Amazon order page, and there was never any issues about the towels not being delivered. Okay, so one night my husband came into our bedroom where I was already sleeping. When he opened the door, our room was dark, but he was able to see an even darker mist floating either right next to me or over me. He said it rushed by him, out the door, and dissipated. That's happened three times now. We have a lot of paranormal activity wherever we live. It doesn't really matter where. Nothing right now feels negative in any way. Mostly just bored, I think. Anyway, has anyone had any experience with a black mist hovering around them while they sleep or could just know what it is? I would like to add that I've been calling my spirit guides. Ought it been when this was happening so it could be that? I don't have a clue and would greatly appreciate any insight. Thanks in advance.
When I was young, my father used to like throwing parties almost every weekend and not just get together. I'm talking hiring a band and inviting friends and family and have them invite friends and family. So I would often see new faces come and go. But there was this one particular time when I was 11 and a girl around 8 years old and her older sister, who was also around 11, came in our house. I was an introverted kid and still am so while everyone was outside socializing. I was inside watching Spongebob like a true scholar would. Well, for some reason, these sisters also didn't want to be outside and came inside and that's when I saw that the little sister didn't have any arms from the elbow down. So the little sister sat on one of the kitchen seats. Our kitchen and living room are connected so it's like one giant room. And the older sister was humoring our Chihuahua we had at the time. And Will Me, being the little introvert that I was their presence, killed my vibe. I got up to go to the kitchen and get a snack so I can head to my room. I get my snack and I make my way to my room, and before I pass the little sister on the kitchen seat, I see her move her stump towards the plate placemat we had at the time, and she motion her stump upwards, and the placemat goes right into the air, and she looks under the placemat. I stop dead in my tracks and just stare at her with awe and confusion, cause my eleven-year-old brain cannot comprehend what the hell is happening before my eyes. Doing this caught the attention of her older sister cause she stopped playing with my dog, looked at her sister and rushed towards her, telling her to put it down and that she knows she shouldn't be doing this around people. She then looks at me and we just make eye contact for a solid three seconds. And that's when my cousin opens the front door and tells me the him, my other cousin, and my brother are going across the street to this knick-knack store to buy something and wanted to see if I wanted to tag along, which I did not hesitate in accepting. I told everyone what I just saw, but no one believed me. When we returned, more people had gotten inside, and they were now surrounded by other girls. But I kept an eye on that sister, the whole party, to see if she would do it again. But nothing ever happened after that. So I wanted to ask if someone else has had a similar experience to this. So my mom is the property manager of a local trailer park. The maintenance man and his assistant were doing a scope of the park at around 1, 30 a.m. when they saw a strange thing on the roof of the trailer. Originally, they thought it was a mountain lion until it stood on two legs. The creature was paper white, his arms hung below his knees, and it was able to jump from trailer top to trailer top. But the weirdest thing it was doing was calling the name of the tenants inside of the trailers. They continued following it until it jumped over a tall fence and was off in the night. My mom would have thought they were just messing with her if it wasn't for the fact that four tenants called my mom the next morning to report something jumping on their roof. I've considered it being the rake or a flesh pedestrian, but there are problems with it being either one of those. Please help. It was about three years ago, in November 2012, when I was working at a small gas station in northeast Louisiana. We were the only small shop in 24-hour service station near Bastrop, just off the highway. I worked the night shift. I loved it. The sharing of stories with the traveling customers, that is when the rare customer showed up. It must have been around 2 a.m., I was cleaning the floors and locking the beer coolers when suddenly the lights went out. I pulled out my cell and used it as a guiding light until I made it back to our counter, where I kicked on the gas generator. It lit the parking lot, the bath, and the hall leading to the register. When I looked outside, I could just make out the movement of the trees across the street, but otherwise, it was pitch black. I turned on the radio and started listening to a local station with its night owl DJ commenting on the heavy winds and cracking jokes between songs. Suddenly I saw some figures in the dark. I could just make them out. They seemed to be a group of kids on bikes. There were three of them. Two of them dropped their bikes and made their way to the door where they just stood there staring at me. I just stared back for a moment, waiting for them to come in. 
They never did. I moved around the counter and opened the door. What's up, guys? Yeah, kinda late, aren't you? I asked them, expecting them to come in. Can we use your phone? One asked, their heads tilted kinda low. I felt a little worried as I pulled my cell from my pocket and offered it to her. Sure. She looked at me and then I saw her eyes. They were solid black, almost like ink, filled orbs. No, I need the real one, she said, her face twisted into an angry snarl. I pulled the door closed and flipped the locks. No, no ma'am, you go home and get your mom's phone. They stared at me through the door for a minute longer before turning away and biking off. The next day, I had my boss check the cameras to get the pictures of the creepy kids. But the cameras had been off the whole time. Now the cameras run off the generator instead of the hall lights. I never saw the kids again. For the past few months, I've been noticing these white things in my security camera footage. They are in the trees and make the trees shake like it's a tornado beneath and make the trees sway back and forth. At first I thought it was the police watching me, but then I keep seeing so many of them in one place. There is no way it's that many cops. They are white and have like a black slit for eyes and a round black nose. They are very sneaky. Once one was hiding behind something outside and kept peeking around. Looking at my cameras like it knew I was watching, I have numerous videos and footage of all this. I tried posting to YouTube, but everyone thinks I'm crazy. It's really starting to bother me because I don't know WTH is going on with these things back when I thought they were cops, I called them Piggy Wiggy. So let's call them that these Piggy Wiggies move in the trees in like a jerking motions and climb up and down tree very fast. I have footage of these piggy wiggies, if you don't believe me. I'm into classical antiquity and thought maybe I had summoned some demons or something when I was trying to speak Latin to these telemarketers that wouldn't quit calling me every day all day, so I said some crazy stuff in Latin hoping it would spook them off like Mercury knows what you did to Babak. is coming for you. There will be no mercy, so that's another thing I thought. I know what you're thinking, but I'm not crazy. Okay. Anyways, please help if you have any idea what they piggies wiggies are. Thank you. I'm staying in Pigeon Forge near the Smoky Mountains right now and in a cabin in the woods. There's other cabins nearby, though. I was dead asleep last night and my boyfriend was still outside in the hot tub and he came inside yelling for me and woke me up he said that he started hearing something big moving around in the forest and he thought it was a bear but he shined his flashlight and it was like something small moving through the grasses that he couldn't see there were multiple of them but they were covered by the grass and moving in different directions he only saw one but it was a little ways in the distance and he described it as long and tan and skin-colored like a person that was on their belly slithering around, but moving really fast and graceful. Then clear as day, he heard a woman's voice scream, Help me, someone? And he says it was the weirdest sound, like it didn't sound like a real person. It sounded rehearsed and fake, and he couldn't tell where it was coming from. Anyone know what this is? We're freaked. I've seen what I believe was either an alien in disguise, a hologram beamed down by aliens, or some other sort of trickery they were using to lure me towards them so they could abduct me and my friends. Here is my story. It was 2001. I was driving my car on the Blue Ridge Parkway near Asheville, North Carolina. My three friends and I spent the day at a nice place called Graveyard Field. I was driving us home, sober by the way, late at night. We were chatting normally when all of a sudden I see a two to three foot tall, all white squirrel standing up right at the edge of the road. My headlamps illuminated it as I drove by and it turned its head to make eye contact and follow my eyes. 
I instantly had the thought that is not of this world. I turned to my friends to say, Did you just see that? All three of them were instantly asleep with their heads tilted to the side and resting on their shoulders. I was flabbergasted. We were just talking seconds ago and now all are asleep. About 20 seconds later I saw a second identical one. Same exact thing happened except I knew my friends were already asleep. My mind was racing. I looked at the clock. I don't think we lost any time. Then the girl in the front seat started waking up, and I excitedly told her the story. Then we saw a third one, identical to the first two. She was equally freaked out by it. I don't think they got us. That's the end of the story. However, a couple years later, I flipped through the pages of a book about UFOs. I think it was Communion by Wiley Straber. I randomly opened a book to a chapter with a drawing of an all-white deer with big black almond-shaped eyes. In the book, he interviews lots of abductees. There's a category of abductees who claim they were in the woods when they saw an all-white animal with big black almond-shaped eyes. When they walked towards it to investigate, they were abducted. This is a true story. Has anyone else ever heard of this phenomenon? Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.